All right. Well, here's a few news articles. Um, this is an interesting one. Um, as I think we all know, the level of disinformation online has gotten outrageous and it's messing up everything. And they're, they asked a bunch of experts, what can you do about it? And uh, they have various solutions here. Uh, probably the most uh, controversial one is that they should make a reality czar and have some kind of government official deciding whether things that are uh, put out are true or not. This is uh, pretty disturbing stuff. I, I mean, I think we're all afraid of uh, government controlled information systems to where everything would just be uh, propaganda. But anyway, we'll see. Um, we used to have an equal time doctrine for political fairness on media. And uh, I mean, the other proposal I hear a lot about is reforming or eliminating Section 230 so that you can sue internet websites the same way you sue uh, like uh, the New York Times and stuff. And that would, uh, that's another option, although it would have a lot of collateral damage, like pretty much ending platforms like Facebook and Twitter, because you couldn't just let people post things anymore. Everything would have to be written by your authors and run through editors before it gets posted, if you're going to be legally liable to it. So that would seem to be an unacceptable level of, of collateral damage, but we will see where it all goes. Uh, Governor DeSantis has proposed a law that would fine platforms daily if they dare to remove political candidates before elections. Uh, this is clearly a response to Twitter banning Trump. The Republicans and right wing typically think he shouldn't have done that, and that was not fair. Um, certainly, Twitter and Facebook and everybody was very torn over this, realizing that they were going to make a lot of people mad by doing that. Anyway, so he wants to make a law in Florida that says you'll have to pay a $100,000 fine every day if you deplatform any candidate during an election. So again, we'll see what comes of that. Um, it sounds like it might be a good idea. Actually, in some ways, maybe I'm certainly, um, this is what everybody said. The problem with Twitter is they couldn't make up their mind. So they dithered back and forth. So then they finally canceled Trump. And then everybody said, look, you either should have done it earlier or later. And they say, well, uh, how do we make a consistent rule? So, you know, now Facebook's trying to have some third party board. This is a huge issue. When do you throw somebody off when they're like big and important or running for office? And nobody knows the answer, but we're all, uh, various proposals are flying around. ID theft doubled in 2020. A lot of it is getting financial aid, um, government benefits fraud mostly unemployment insurance, a lot more of it, as you might imagine. Uh, there's been a lot of studies showing that the large amount of uh, extra financial aid available during the pandemic, a lot of that was stolen by various forms of fraudsters. So that I think is probably always the case when you have uh, government benefits programs. And uh, But anyway, it certainly seems to have happened. Jeff Bezos is going to retire as the CEO and move over to sort of a more uh, uh, visionary and uh, charity oriented role. So that may have a big effect on Amazon. Um, we'll see what happens. Governor Newsom looks like he's going to lose his office. There's a large movement to recall him. Um, he came out with an awful lot of big promises about COVID sort of saying we could all get our shot in February and then it didn't seem to happen at all. And he seemed to, after having in the early days, a strict lockdown that was generally successful and approved of, he then opened everything and let it spread. And uh, people are very, very angry about the way he handled the pandemic and his popularity is falling and people want to kick him out and replace him, which might happen. We've done it before in California. Elon Musk has made this thing called Neuralink that sticks chips in the brains of a monkey and the monkey can then play video games. Why people publicly stop talking about solar winds? Oh, I don't know. There's still news articles going around about solar winds. It's going to keep going on for years, but I haven't seen anything much worth saying about it lately. Um, it's carrying on, but I, I didn't see anything new to say. Um, anyway, the um, so now he says he's going to start human trials, and the human trials are going to start with people who, for example, are paralyzed which we already have various systems for them. And he's going to try to make things where you can control robot arms and stuff, which there already are other attempts to do that. 
And then he would like to start with uh, people that are paralyzed and then hopefully move to like healthy people who want to augment their brain with a computer interface, which I think will be a while getting approval from the medical community. But anyway, it's, um, we'll see what comes of it. That's the kind of big stuff that Elon Musk does. Um, well, yeah, they say Bill Gates put chips in our vaccine. That's right. Elon talked, that's right. He talked about it during Clubhouse. I mean, I think it's very interesting. Google talked about it. The Google founders said they'd make a Google chip to put in your brain. And, you know, uh, this is a staple in science fiction. And by the way, one thing I'm amazed never happened in the 60s, they put wires in the pleasure center of rats so they could give themselves pleasure by just sticking, by hitting an electrode. And the prediction of science fiction authors at the time was this would become the new illegal drug. Just stick an electrode in your brain and zap yourself. And it might be good for people with chronic pain and people that are addicted to drugs and stuff. And somehow it never happened. I don't understand what prevented it. But anyway, it may come back again. Uh, if this is used to help people with disabilities, that would be great. But that is fantasy. Well, the pleasure center is certainly not fantasy. They have done it to a few humans and it more or less worked. So I mean, it can be done. I'm just surprised um, those chips are so small. Well, the chip is inside your head, so it's not gonna fly away. Anyway, all right. So I think we're up to the official time here. So I'll skip the rest of it. I mean, the rich will get it before commoners. Oh yes, of course. I mean, when it, well, I don't know. Um, I, that's, it could go a lot of ways. Anyway, um, uh, one thing I thought is it would be cheaper and probably healthier than a drug like heroin. Anyway, um, so here we're here. This is Tuesday, this is the malware analysis. So what I'm gonna do is just talk about the next couple chapters in the book, um, basic dynamic analysis, and then demonstrate some of the projects. And I've got one set of cahoots. So let me see if I can share the right window. All right. I'm slowly uh, improving my system here. All right. So there's my cahoots or my slides. Rather. All right. So here we are. So um, we're going to talk, we're going to do all our malware analysis for this course in virtual machines. And so when you're gonna do that, you're gonna deliberately infect the machine. And if you're using real nasty malware, it messes it up. Um, so you need a safe environment. Your main concern is that you should not really spread the malware to other machines that matter in your network. Um, you could use a separate real hardware machine with an air gap, no network connection. And that would meet the military standards for most uh, security classifications. Um, a real machine is very nice. Um, and it has the advantage that malware will almost always fall for it because it is not going to be able to detect it in a virtual machine. If it's on a real machine, it'll probably treat it as a real victim. Um, but of course, that means you're going to have to re-image the machine, which is kind of a drag, although it's really not that hard these days to put a backup image on something like a USB device and restore from the image. But it's not as easy as uh, recreating a virtual machine. Virtual machines are the most common technique. Um, and this generally protects the host machine from the malware. There is a possibility that malware can escape the virtual machine and infect the host. So you should be aware of that. Uh, you should probably be running antivirus on the host or running a different kind of operating system like Linux or a Mac for the host that would help. And uh, keeping everything updated would help. But none of them are perfect defenses. I mean, the real air gap with a real physical machine would be more perfect separation. So VMware, Workstation Player for on Windows and Fusion on Mac now are both free for education. The free versions don't let you take snapshots of your machine. So you'd have to you know, rebuild your machine from zero if you want to. If you have the pay version, you can actually take a snapshot right before running the malware, run it, and then restore to the snapshot. So you get back to a condition without the malware and with all your tools and other settings set up. And of course, you could use any other virtualization system just as well. They all work about the same. So <coughs> you can, Isolate, you can make a virtual machine with no networking at all, if you like, by removing or disconnecting the network adapter, or you can make host only networking, where it can only see one machine, just the host, like it was on a little uh, two party local area network. And that way you could like add software to it by downloading it on the host and then copying it in. Um, but normally that's not good enough because most malware um, phones home. A lot of it does. Phone home, reach out to servers. And if it can't reach the servers, then you're not going to be able to assess that property of the malware. So there are different networking modes. Network address translation mode is usually the best. 
That way the virtual machines can see each other and they see the internet, but there's a virtual router between the virtual machine and the LAN. I've done projects in the past where I was uh, practicing attacks in a coffee house. And because I wasn't in that mode, the attack actually affected other people in the coffee house. It wasn't a very bad attack. So I didn't get in big trouble, but that's why NAT mode is better. NAT mode isolates your machine behind a router from the other machines that might be on your network. All right. Um, so you can take a snapshot, like I say, you take a snapshot, then you run the malware, you let it run, you analyze it with your tools, and then you revert back to the known clean state. That is, uh, that's the nice way you can do it if you have the uh, full featured version of a virtualization software. All right, so like I say, uh, the one risk is your malware might not do its malicious activity when it detects it's in a VM. Virtual machines do not hide their identity very much at all. The network adapter is named something like VMware or virtual network adapter, and there are registry keys. There's a bunch of easy ways to tell you're in a virtual machine. So that's an issue. Um, all the samples we're gonna use here, of course, are not very malicious. Uh, they don't really spread. So there's not too much to worry about. The only thing about them is some of them are kind of hard to remove. So you wouldn't want to just put them on your normal machine because they might have little pop-up boxes irritating you and stuff, but they're not really going to do any great harm. And especially they're not going to spread to other innocent machines around you. All right. So dynamic analysis is um, your static analysis, like we talked about using tools to see what language it's written in and to read the strings in the malware is how you start. But for um, dynamic analysis, you want to run it and see what happens. For example, the malware might be packed or obfuscated. All of the strings might be scrambled so you can't read them. And the malware contains code that unscrambles them. And the easiest way to deal with that is to just run it. So it unscrambles itself and then you can examine it. So dynamic analysis is the fastest, easiest way to see a lot about what malware does. It's also dangerous and sloppy a little bit dangerous in that you're running malware. So you hopefully have mitigated that by running in a safe virtual machine. It's also uh, possible that you'll get the wrong answer because the malware confuses your tools. So you just have to understand what you're doing. Now there are automated sandboxes out there, a bunch of them like the Joe Sandbox and Norman and a bunch of others. And these um, just automatically run it in a virtual machine, automatically measure various properties and just report the results. You don't have to, it basically automatically does the kind of stuff we're gonna do manually, which is fine. That's a one level of analysis. So when you're launching malware, if you have executable, you can just run it of course, but if you have a DIL and you wanna run it without the associated executable that normally loads it, then you have to launch the DIL and you can't do that without an EXE. Now Windows gives you a program called run DIL 32, which will let you launch a DIL. So that's one way to do it. So you don't have to write your own software, although we're going to write quite a lot of software that loads DILs here. You'll totally see how to do it. It's not very hard to do. We'll be making our own executables and launching libraries if you do the extra credit uh, Flare VM machines. But anyway, you don't need to write your own program. You can use run DIL 32. And then you would um, refer to the DIL and then have an exported function and some arguments. So you would load the DIL and then run this function exported from the DIL with those arguments. Uh, so for example, rip.dil has install and uninstall. So you could run DIL 32, rip.dil comma install. That will run an executable, load the library and call the install method. All right. And by the way, we're gonna see this later. Um, some uh, libraries don't use names. They just have numbers to refer to the methods. So that's another possibility. All right, you can also mod convert a DIL into an EXE, uh, write your own EXE to call a DIL. There's a lot of ways to do it. Process Monitor is one of the main tools you use here. This Process Monitor is actually just a GUI tool that lets you see the Windows event log in a more useful, friendly way than the Windows event viewer. So what this does is it um, runs and captures all the events. And the reason it's more valuable is it does show you the events in this nice display where you have a line per event. And you can turn on these filters to carefully filter to just see events from a certain process or events with a certain action, like setting a registry key or creating a file. So you can take the vast number of events, like you see right down here, 128,000 events. And that's probably in just a few seconds. So it is very, very fast. And so you, um, you run it and you can see the events here it's very handy. You can't leave it running too long. It will actually fill the RAM and crash. But um, 
it lets you see what goes on. And here's the events I saw by just launching calculator. So you can start and stop it with the magnifying glass, which is, by the way, a very strange icon. Normally, that would be a search. Erase the events, filter the events. And here's the default filters for registry events, file system events, uh, network events, and processes. All right, uh, so one simple thing to do, uh, the simplest thing would be to include only events with the name of your malware. And if your malware is really simple, and it just launches one process with the name you expect. It doesn't load or run anything else. That would work, but much malware doesn't do that. A lot of malware launches other processes. So what's a better technique is to remove all the normal activity. So you start with this thing with all kinds of stuff scrolling by and you remove everything that you see until you don't see anything here. So that the clean machine before the malware is running shows no events. Then you run the malware and you see all the extra events that are added. It's not perfect, of course, because you're just blocking by process name, but it's pretty good. All right. And so uh, you can also do by including things with a certain process name. Um, process name is procmon.exe and so on. All right. And so then there's Process Explorer. This is the upgrade of Task Manager. Task Manager is Microsoft's tool to see what's currently running on your machine. Process Explorer is the more powerful equivalent. And the result is it um, you see much more information about the processes. For example, Task Manager would just show you one process called Service Host. But this shows you the much more detailed information that there are something like 10 different Service Host processes, and each one of them does different things. So you can see in much more detail what's going on with your processes here. Uh, so services are pink, the things that run before someone logs in and provides service to other processes. Down at the bottom will be the things launched by the user. Um, and uh, you'll see processes turn green when they launch and turn red when they're uh, removed. Then you can, in Process Explorer, uh, you can switch it to DIL mode with a lower pane view down here, and it will show you all the libraries. This one uses advanced API, 32.dil, and other libraries. And you can go to the properties in Process Explorer, and it will show you a lot more information. It'll show you whether it is using data execution prevention and address-based layout randomization, which are important defenses that we're going to talk about a lot in the exploit development class. Um, data execution prevention, um, marks areas of memory non-executable, so you cannot inject code and run it there. And address space layout randomization causes the base address of a process to be randomly changed every time that process is relaunched so that a malware author that tries to inject code and run that code has difficulty finding the code. Both of these have a very strong effect at preventing kinds of uh, many memory corruption vulnerabilities. Anyway, you can also hit this button to see if the disk um, matches, if the, if the disk file matches its signature, if it is signed code, which is nice, but a lot of malware is not signed. And as we're going to see, um, process replacement is a common trick where you load a program from disk. Now, normally when you load a program, it copies the, the file directly from the disk into the memory section by section, but you can replace the memory file with different code. So something different is running than what was on the disk. That's called process replacement. And this verify button will not detect that. But what will detect it is if you go to the strings tab, for example, you've got image and memory. So you can see the strings right here in the image on disk or on the image in memory, and they should be the same. And if they're not, that indicates process replacement. All right, you can open a malicious document like the PDF or the vulnerable application and watch. A normal PDF should just be opened like a document in your PDF reader, but a malicious PDF might launch other processes like a keylogger or something. And one simple thing is you'd see more processes launch. <clears throat> There's a tool called RedShot that I thought was cool, though I haven't really used it that much. I prefer using a process monitor to watch the registry changes, but you can do it this way too. You take a shot it just records the whole registry. Then you run the malware and take a second shot, and then you can compare them and get a long text file listing all the registry changes. This is essentially, by the way, how you create a Windows installer. 
you, uh, one thing I always wondered about when I started using Windows long ago is all the installers look exactly the same. They all have the same messages, close every other application and so on. And um, there, Microsoft gives you a tool to do this, to take a shot of the machine, install your stuff, take another shot, and it will automatically create a program that does that install. Uh, this file with a PDF extension, uh, this PDF I opened, was, uh, it could be either. But if you open it, if you open a normal PDF, it won't launch other processes. A malicious one might. It could do a variety of things, but PDFs are often contain malicious content. So it's uh, it's one of the many PDFs and Office documents are very commonly uh, the source of malicious activity. Now another issue is if this is an interesting issue and sort of gets you into a philosophical, even a moral issue. So suppose I mentioned before, if you make your machine so it doesn't connect to the internet. Then when you run the malware, it can't phone home, download more software. So you're not really going to see all the behavior of the malware. Now, what most Americans do and what we're going to do is just connect to the real internet and let it phone off to the real servers. And other people, like especially the European antivirus researchers, are unwilling to do that. They say, you can't let your machine connect to criminal servers and engage in crime. That would be wrong. So what they do is they use these fake internet services. And... Uh, INET SIM is the one I find the best results with. It's in, you can install it on Linux. It's included in Kali. And this gives you a fake internet that has all the common internet processes. It doesn't, not the real internet. All the web pages are the same and stuff, but you can make connections. So this is what you do if you really don't want to let your malware phone home. But most people find it to be too much bother and just let your malware phone home. <laughs> What's one more bot for a while? But anyway, you could use an NCAT either the Windows or Linux version to just listen on a port. If you just want one port to listen, so it'll do a TCP handshake and you'll tell it's trying to connect, but it won't get anything after that. Um, so, you know, you can do NCAT minus L80. And then if I try to go to that address in a browser, it will make the connection, but then it won't be able to load a web page. It can do the handshake, but there is no response to the HTTP request. But, and you can do a packet sniffing with Wireshark and you can see that it did the handshake, but it won't get any further. Um, but if you, um, all right, and I don't know what that's about. Um, something popping up on one of my devices. Uh, okay. Anyway, uh, but INET SIM looks like this. You run INET SIM and now you configure your machine to um, use this for its DNS server and its gate. And then what happens is every DNS request will go to INET SIM and it will resolve every address to equal this address. So it'll send all traffic there. And then if you go to any URL at all, it'll see this page. So I can go to fred.com, which is not a real website and it'll all show you this page. So it will see some HTML page and some FTP page and everything else. And if you run an Nmap scan, it'll find all kinds of open ports. Almost every common service is open and providing a little bit of response. So it appears to let you uh, connect, send email, FTP, and all the other common services. So you start Procman. You can filter on the malware executable name, clear all the events. Start Process Explorer, RedShot, set up your virtual network, and run Wireshark. And then when you run malware, you'll get a lot of traces about all the things that it does. All right, so let's try a Kahoot. I've got them open here. Let me move my share here. And there it is. Good. We'll do this one and then uh, I'll process this video and demonstrate the first couple projects here. So we are 126 chapter three here. Hmm, it looks like it's doing it again where it fails to show the right page. So let me see if I can get it to work by stopping the share and restarting. Ah, it paused the share, that's all good. Okay, good, fair enough. So uh, looks like it's working. Hmm. Can't control my sound. Well, that's life. 
There's always something. Oh, I know why. It's trash. There we go. The glorious sound. All right. I think the class might, oh, okay. Are there entry level positions involving this stuff? Uh, I don't know. Um, it's not one of the main activities. Um, I think it's a more advanced one. All the issues I've had with my Zoom, I don't think it's my ISP. I think it's all the, the uh, extra monitors I'm using that confuse it. Anyway, um, I'll give it a few more seconds to see if any more people are joining. <coughs> Yeah, some people still joining. The 47,000 viruses. Yeah, well, that's another option. Yeah. All right. Well, let's do this. All right. What method will make malware smaller? <coughs> All right, that's packing. Good. All right, what kind of file do you run with Rundill thirty two? It's like who's buried in Grant's tomb? Dills, of course. All right. And what tool records thousands of events? So you must exclude most of them to get any benefit from it. All right, that's process monitor. Good. All right, which tool will show you the Ethernet frames? Our shark, good. And what tool lets you analyze botnet malware without contacting a real server? Okay, that's INET SIM. Good. All right, so the winners. Okay, that might be a real name. If not, somebody will have to tell me. That looks like it might be a real name too. And that's probably not a real name. So people have to tell me their real name in the chat if they want their points. All right. Well, I'm going to stop this one and process the video. So we'll have about a 10 minute break. Um, so I can have a separate video.